Hello everybody. Thank you for joining to this webinar. My name is Gadi Solotorevsky. I am the CTO of Cividia. I'm also an ambassador, a distinguished fellow, and the revenue assurance team leader of the TM Forum. In today's webinar, I want to touch three topics. First, I want to give you some information, some statistics, some results of survey about revenue assurance from the last couple of years. Then we will speak about changes in revenue assurance best practices. And then we will speak about new business models that we are seeing today in our industry and what is the impact that they have on revenue assurance. And at the end, there will be place for questions. So if you have anything in mind, just put it on the chat, and we will touch it at the end of the presentation. So let's drill down. So let's look at the survey from Ernest and Young for 2013. And there they ask, what is your estimation about your revenue leakage and your fraud leakage? And the answers were quite interesting. A lot of operators estimated that they have leakage less than 0.5% of their total revenues, about 40% of them while a similar number, about 40%, estimated that they have revenue leakages between 0.5 and 2% of their revenues. Now, these numbers may sound low, but you need to consider two things. First, how much money is 0.5% of your revenues? It's a huge amount of money. Then you also need to consider very careful the question that was asked. They ask about the perceptions of the operators. And from my experience, sometimes operators that don't have a good control of their revenue assurance leakage issues are optimistic. So they tend to under-evaluate their leakage. Another very interesting point in this survey was that 5% of the operators were not in a position to assess their revenue assurance leakage. The situation is worse if you look at the fraud column in yellow, but even 5% of operators that are clueless regarding the amount of leakage they have is a very scary number. Now we can see results to a similar question asked by KPMG in our survey from 2012 on the left part of the screen. And there you can see some very interesting things. First, you have a distribution according to geographical areas. And you see that geographical areas, operators in different geographical areas, have quite a different behavior. A very interesting thing, if you look at the light blue part, revenue leakage of more than 10% of your revenues. Wow, that's an amazing number. If you look in the areas in Europe and the Americas, you have 50% of the operators, 50% that believe that they have leakage over than 10% of the revenues. In Asia, 10%, and in Africa and the Middle East, 18%. Now, it's difficult for me to understand this reality because, you know, 10% of your revenues is wow. And you have it, and you are aware that you are having that leakage and you are not doing something to prevent it. Sounds scary. But that's the situation according to KPMG. 
Now, if we move to a survey on the right part of the screen by the TM Forum, we also try to investigate there what are the main causes for revenue assurance leakages. And look, let's look at the four top causes, poor system integration, high level of manual processes, poor processes and procedures, and uncontrolled change management. So obviously, when you put your controls, your revenue assurance controls, you don't put directly a control on these. But these are the main causes for leakages. So have in mind, and we will speak about it a little bit later, that if you want to be proactive, and I will try to convince you that you want to be proactive, you need not just to look at the leakage, the control that is comparing system A with system B, but how to prevent that leakage. So have these four reasons in mind, and we'll speak about it a little bit more later, but this is really important. Now, this is the survey from the TM Forum. I confess it's a little bit old. It's from 2011, three years ago. But it's a very interesting survey in the sense that it's the only survey that I know that didn't ask revenue insurance managers about their estimations, but about what they actually detected. And the average was that a revenue insurance department detected on the average 2% of the total revenues of the operators as revenue leakage. This is an amazing number. Of course, it's an average, so some operators detect it much less, others much more, but it's still an amazing average. Also, from my experience, three years later, the situation in the industry is a little bit better, but still not below the 1, 1.5 percent, a personal estimation. Now, a second very important point is, OK, I detected this leakage. How much of it I'm expected to recover? And this was one of the most interesting results of this survey. And I think it was the first survey that drilled down to the recovery aspect. And the answers we got there were that only 31% of the detected leakage was recovered. So if you detect 2% of leakage, about 0.7% of your total revenues you will recover. That's a very high number. But about 0. Uh, sorry, 1.3% of your revenue leakages you will not recover. And that's a scary number. Now we went and we investigated of these 69% that you will not recover, why you are not recovering it. And the answers were really interesting. First, of these 70% that you are not recovering, you could recover 43%. But operators decide not to recover it. Why? In some cases, the cost of recovery was too high. In other cases, there were business reasons. For example, you detected a leakage with a big enterprise customer. You don't want to go and do back bill because you are afraid that he will move to the competition. So you decide, OK, I have this leakage. I will live with it. 57% of the 69% that you did not recover, you were not able to recover. Why? For example, for technical reasons, you have CDRs without A numbers. So this is very interesting. And I think that this is one of the most strong evidence for the value of preventing leakages. If you just detect a, detect a leakage, you will save 30% of what you detected. 
if you prevent a leakage, you will save 100% of you, what you prevented. That's a big difference. Now the report from Ernest and Young from 2013 also checked this, and they got similar results to the results that the TM4 got on 2011. Also here we can see that about 30% of the operators are recovering less than 30% of the leakage that they detected. An additional 20, uh, 25% are recovering between 30 and 50% of their leakages. And only about 40% of the operators are recovering more than 50% of the leakage they detected. So start from the situation that you don't detect all your leakages. And then you have a recovery that is very important, very impressive, but still all, only a fraction of your leakage. Now if you could prevent the leakage from the beginning by being proactive, you would avoid all this. Have this all the time in mind, and in a few slides we will speak about how revenue assurance is changing from being reactive to being proactive. Let's look now about a survey performed by the TM Forum last year. And the TM Forum is performing surveys about revenue issues each year. This year we just ended collecting the information from operators, and this year we had over 100 operators participating in it. The results will be published in two, three months. But let's look about last year results. And the question in this survey came from questions asked by operators. And one interesting thing that we are seeing is that today, revenue assurance in most places is located under the finance department. This is not to say that it's a good location or a bad location, but this is a picture of what is happening in the industry. And it's quite a change from the past. If you look at revenue assurance eight, nine years ago, you would see that revenue assurance was mostly under IT, in some cases under networks, in some cases under security. And now you see a shift, a very strong shift, to being under the finance department. Another interesting thing are the degrees of separation between the revenue insurance manager and the board level. And it shows about the influence that revenue insurance has in the organization. And again, if you compare it to several years ago, when revenue insurance started, you would see that the answers would be five degrees, six degrees of separation, and even more. And today we are seeing that revenue insurance managers in most of organizations are one degree of separation or two degrees of separation from the board level. And this is very important. It shows, on one hand, the importance that operators give to the revenue insurance activities, and on the other hand, the power that revenue insurance has to do things to help the operator. So it's important to understand how it changed from the past and the powers it gives us. Uh, another interesting question that people always ask me is, what is the average number of people working in a revenue insurance department? And the results were interesting because we saw that there is a degree of correlation between the revenues of the operator and the volume, the number, of the revenue insurance department. But you have some surprises. So you have operators with 
over 10 billion revenues that have a revenue insurance department of six to 10 people. And it's a good question if the six and 10 people manage to give a very good coverage of revenue insurance or not. But again, this is a picture of the situation today. But I would say that on the, no, on the average, there is an increase of the volume of the size of the revenue insurance team that it's related to the revenues of the operator. It changes a little bit according to the geographical areas, according to the ratio between legacy and new systems, according to the types of services, but you can see more or less this correlation. A Another interesting result from the study by KPMG, they ask revenue insurance managers what is their most important function in the organization. And it quite surprised me, the results here. I would expect to have 100% of the revenue insurance manager saying my primary responsibility is to prevent, detect, and recover revenue leakage. But only 80% of them sees these as their primary responsibility. And some of them sees assisting in fraud prevention. Some of them seeing a, a proactive identification of new technologies as their primary responsibility. I would say the first responsibility of revenue insurance people should always be revenue insurance. Yes, there are very important second responsibilities, help to the fraud department, help to revenue management, cost reduction, etc. And we will speak in a minute about the relation between revenue assurance and costs. And of course, in my view, cost assurance is part of revenue assurance, but we'll speak about it in a minute. We spoke about the distribution of revenue assurance activities between reactive, active, and proactive. Reactive revenue assurance just detect the problem after it already happened. Active revenue assurance is you detect the problem after it happened, but before it has an impact on the bill. For example, you detect a bad CVR, you correct it, and you inject it back to the billing system before the bill goes out. And proactive revenue assurance is about preventing the problem or if you detect a problem, to solve the root cause of the problem. So if you had looked at the distribution between these three types of revenue insurance six, seven years ago, almost everybody was quite reactive. Today you can see that there is almost an even distribution between the three types of revenue insurance. Revenue insurance department are investing a third of resources in reactive activities, a third in active activities, and a third in proactive activities. And the use case is very simple. By being proactive, you save, as we saw before, three times the, the money that you would save by being reactive. So it's very important to be proactive. We see also that there is a strong correlation between the degree of reactive activities and the maturity of the operators. And we'll speak later about the maturity model of the TN Forum and how it changed over the last year. So we clearly see an operator that is really very mature with regard to revenue insurance activities it will be a, defini a division of almost 30, 30, 30. An operator with initial maturity will spend most of his time doing reactive and active activities, and only a fifth of his time 
being proactive. So how you can be proactive? Two key things for being proactive is being there from the design phase. Revenue insurance, in my view, should be involved in change management and should be involved in new products development. Years ago, when I spoke about this, people told me, we are revenue insurance. We are about to find leakages. Why we should be involved in change management, in product development? The reason is exactly if you want to be proactive, you need to be there. You need to understand the products. You need to give your input to the development of products. You need to put in place controls that will prevent problems and not wait until you have their catastrophe. And again, we see that there is a strong correlation between the degree of maturity of operators and their involvement in change management and their involvement in a new product development. For example, if we are speaking about change management, we see that they are strongly involved over 85% for new operators. They are no strong involvement. Sometimes they are involved not more than that. And being involved there is a key for being proactive. Being proactive is not just about placing more controls. It's not just about giving more information, but it's about checking things from day one, from the day they started to be designed. I mentioned several times the TM Forum and their revenue insurance activities. And I just want to point out why this is so, the TM Forum is so important for revenue insurance. The TM Forum, over the last 10 years almost, is generating best practices for revenue insurance. It published two main documents, TR 131 and GB941. And the first very interesting thing is that these are not just theoretical documents. These are documents that are really being used by the industry. So in the survey we performed in 2012, we saw that the revenue insurance maturity model was used by 63% of the operators that participated in the survey. GB941 as a whole by 56%. And other addendums of GB941 also by large percentage, 38, 44%, etc. We'll speak about what you can find in each of these documents. And I will give you a glimpse of what changed over the last year in these best practices. So in GB941A, you can find standard revenue insurance metrics. In GB941B, you can find the maturity model. In GB941D, you can find examples of typical leakage points. And in GB941E and F, you can find the risk model for revenue insurance. And it's a very interesting model. We will not speak about it today too much. Just to mention, revenue insurance today, modern revenue insurance today, is highly related to, with methodologies that, of enterprise risk management. These methodologies, the adoption of these methodologies to revenue insurance is described in GB941E. So let's speak a little bit about the revenue insurance maturity model because it changed quite a lot in the last year.
First, as you saw, it's widely used by the industry. 63% of the participating operators are using it. It's not just a model for scoring your maturity. It's a more model that permits you to understand your capabilities and what are the recommended capabilities improvements. You can use it for internal and external benchmarking. And even though this model was very successful and many operators were using it, we decided that we need to improve it. The model was quite old, about eight years old. Revenue shows evolved a lot in these eight years. So there was a need to improve this model. And the new model is speaking about four major areas, the organization, the process, the measurement, and the technology. In the organization, we're checking things like, do you have a revenue strategy? Do you have clear goals? Is your organization fit for the revenue assurance requirements? What is the skill set of the revenue assurance team? Do they have enough business knowledge? What is the relation with other departments? In the processes, we check if there is a clear revenue planning and review process. Are you using risk management techniques? Are you involved in change management? Are you involved in in-life product reviews? Who is doing the operation of primary controls, the operational area of revenue assurance? Who is doing the operation of secondary controls? In measurement, we check things like, are you using a measurement framework when you detect a leakage? Do you have a clear methodology for evaluating the value of the leakage? Do you have a clear methodology for evaluating the capacities, the results of the activities of revenue assurance? Are you measure your risk mitigation? Are you measure the leakage and the benefits I will measure the efficiency and effectiveness of your controls. Are you estimating your unmeasured leakage? When we speak about technology, we speak about technology strategy. We speak about the functionality of the revenue assurance tool set, the access of information of the revenue assurance department or tool, the data analysis capabilities, etc. So these are four very important areas. And we provide also an Excel tool that permits you to do a uh, self-assessment. Of course, this is provided to PM4. Or you can use it to work with a consultant to do a more deep analysis. And for those who were familiar with the previous revenue assurance maturity model, it was built of a small set of 50 questions, very difficult questions, with very complex answers. We changed the mindset this time. We built a questionnaire of about 500 questions, but very simple questions, very simple answers. So does our revenue assurance strategy document exist? Yes, no. What is time period does the RA strategy cover, one year, two years, et cetera. So it's a long list of questions, but clear, very clear, very simple questions, very simple answers. And according to that, you first can get your score. But more than that, you can see what answers will lead you to a better score and use it to build an improvement plan. We mentioned revenue assurance metrics. And here you can see the list of revenue assurance metrics that we created at the TM Forum also about eight years ago. And there are some evolutions. I will not go with you now over all this list. You can have the presentation later so you can see it. But let's see what is about to change here. 
So if we are speaking about data quality, data quality is very important for revenue insurance to understand the coverage, the amount of leakage, etc. And in the past, we didn't have a good tool to measure data quality. So we put there four KPIs that were the best that we could offer, but weren't really good exact KPIs. So we are deleting these four KPIs, and we are introducing new KPIs. The first set of new KPIs is about cost assurance. You know, sometimes people argue, is cost assurance part of revenue assurance or not? For me, for Cividia, clearly, if you are not charging the correct amount or if you are not paying the correct amount, underpayment, overpayment, undercharging, overcharging, it's potato, potato. It's the same thing. But in the TM forum, due to historical discussions, these KPIs were not included in the first version, so we are now adding four new KPIs. We're looking at overpayments to third parties, overpayments of commissions and incentives, percentages of discounts, goodwill credits and adjustments, and percentage of unjustified discounts, goodwill credits and adjustments. Also, a new part that is entering here instead of the data quality, because it can be used to measure the same, but in a better way, is to measure your maturity, to measure the improvement or reduction in your maturity, to measure your risk level, and this is a very good, much more exact measure than the data quality, to measure the risk production as a result of putting revenue insurance controls. By the way, for me, a control is all, not just something that you do in money map or in a tool. Also, being part of a change process management is a control. It's a, not an automatic control. You need to send a person there to sit in the meetings, but it's also a control. And also, we are speaking about revenue insurance coverage. What is the quality of coverage? What is the uh, volume of coverage? How much of your revenue streams you are covering? At what quality? So these KPIs are quite new. They are already approved by the revenue insurance team, and they will enter to the documentation of the TM form shortly. So some other very new things that we are doing in revenue insurance is the relation between revenue insurance and big data analytics. And we are running a catalyst, and I will show this catalyst in an event in San Jose next week. And the idea is that the same information can be used for many applications. It can be used for marketing analytics. It can be used for revenue insurance. It can be used for fraud management. And not just by the tools of one vendor, but many vendors may put different use cases on top of the same data. And in the past, there was a vision of having a single data warehouse that will help all the applications. And in most cases, it did not work. It did not work for very good reasons and very justifiable reasons. I will not enter into it, but it did not work. When we are speaking about big data, the volumes of data will be huge. If I start to record not just information about calls, but also information about data, et cetera, it will be a huge amount of information. Now, replicating this information again and again will be very painful. So the idea of this catalyst that we are going to present next week is how we can you have a common analytics big data repository to be used by different applications from different vendors. And many operators are pushing this concept. Obviously, for the point of view of the operator, it's much better to have all the data, one copy, not duplicated, one time to do the ETL, et cetera. So I'm very excited about this concept. It's really, it's a very simple concept, but it's really very new. And it will avoid data replications. It will save cost in ETL. It will save hardware. And once you have the data, you have to be able to implement new use cases on top of that data faster. So this is a new vision. And again, not just 
the same the company using the COSIX product, the same database, but sharing the information across uh, vendors, across use cases. I'm really excited about it. It's new. And I think that this is the direction the industry will go. And of course, revenue assurance have a central part because revenue assurance knows the information from all the directions. So revenue assurance, in my view, have a central part in defining what will go into this uh, big data analytics platform. Future trends. So we are seeing a lot of changes. I will speak about some of this more in detail in just a minute. But we are seeing that the mobile billing is becoming more sophisticated. In the past, we had very complex data plans. Uh, sorry, very complex uh, voice plans, very simple data plans. Today, it's changing. The voice plans are really simple in most places. The data plans are becoming more and more complex, charging complexity, platforms that combine prepaid, postpaid, in some cases for the same client. Etc. So many things are coming and being different. Let's go directly to some examples. I believe that it's very important for revenue assurance all the time to be aware of what are the business models. At the end of the day, our process, our revenue assurance process, are there to support the business models. So we cannot protect today the business models of five years ago. They are disappearing. So one change we see in many parts of the world, not in always all parts, but in many parts, flat rates for voice for SMS. What is the meaning for that? And you know, the first reaction of our national department when this started to emerge was, OK, we don't need more revenue assurance. That's incorrect, because even if we charge a flat rate, we pay our interconnect partner according to minutes. We pay our roaming partner according to minutes. So we need to be very careful here. We need to analyze our margins. LT, LT is not just a new technology. Well, it's not so new anymore. It's there almost two, three years. But it's also new business models. People start to speak more and more about quality of service on demand. The move to LT also give open the door for family plans and we'll speak about it and sponsor data and privilege data will speak about it. Quality of service on demand I already mentioned and data exchange will speak about it about MTM and IoT, we'll not speak about it. It deserves a complete hour to see how IoT are impacting revenue assurance, the business models, et cetera. We could later do another webinar about just this point. It will take at least one hour. But be aware that if everything here have an effect on the business model, have an effect on what you should protect and how you should protect it. So if we just look back two years ago, the first deployments of LT, and many operators thought, OK, LT, a great opportunity to make more money. I will increase my rates. And we see here this example for France. Uh, France Telecom said, OK, I will give LT subscriptions. I'm planning to charge 5 or 10 euros more than a 3G package. Great idea, great concept. More velocity, I can charge more for it. And then came the competition and say, you know something? I'm free in France. Until now, I was charging 99, $19, sorry, 19 euros, 99 cents or 15 euro 99 cents for my mobile plan, no problem. I will continue to charge the same. But on top of that, I will give 20 gigabytes of free LTE traffic. OK, obviously, this requires a change in the paradigm of the 
competitors. So you should be aware we are in a very dynamic environment. You should be aware that any change is for a short period, and you should be able to react. If you are here at the beginning of 2013, France Telecom, you need to verify that you are charging this extra. At the end of the year, this extra may stop being relevant. You need to be able to change your controls very quickly. Sponsor data. Sponsor data is very new, less than one year. It's, I would say today, still an experiment, but I think an experiment not from the point of view of technology, but an experiment from the point of view of what will happen with it in the market. The idea is very simple. I have a subscription for a service, let's say ESPN, sports, and in some cases, because my bandwidth, my bundle, my data bundle is small, I'm not using this service. So obviously, from the point of view of the server, the content provider, there is a risk that I will stop being there. I would say, okay, not using this enough, I don't want to pay subscription. So the idea was, if I'm using this content from ESPN, let ESPN pay for this content instead of me paying for it. So this is called sponsor data. A second part of sponsor data, and it's still under discussions in the course, is net neutrality. Because perhaps instead of just charging for the data the content provider, perhaps I will charge the content provider according to the quality of data. So if Netflix wants their subscribers to get a better quality of data, better quality of streaming, then HBO, then let Netflix pay for it. There is a problem there with net network neutrality. There are many legal issues there. But think how this can change all your business models. Think what information you will need in order to ensure that you are billing correctly in this environment. So many changes, maybe plain tech it may impact the way you treat it, information. Very interesting. I am following all the time what is happening in the states in the courts. What is what are the discussions there about net neutrality? can really impact the way we work. Another very interesting scenario, China Mobile. China Mobile in Hong Kong launched an exchange platform for 4G minutes. The idea is like this. I have a bundle. I have a bundle of 3 giga. Now I'm using only two of these 2 giga and the end of the month arrives. Now, one option for me is, okay, we'll lose that extra giga, but in that case, China Mobile will not receive more money. And I may decide, okay, I want to downgrade my bundle because I'm not using it. So the idea of China Mobile was, I will permit those users to sell their extra data capacity to other users. And I will charge for this commission. Okay and assume that this business model is good, is working correctly, then the question is how you as revenue assurance will verify it. Suddenly, you need to verify what is happening in an exchange platform, that all the accounting is correctly between the different subscribers, between the subscribers on China Mobile, so very interesting situation, very new. I haven't seen this in many places. But you need to think, okay, if this will happen in my area, am I capable to support this? Uh, share everything or family plans. They started in the States, or at least they started to get a lot of attention in the States. The Horizon and AT&T came with this kind of plan. The idea is very simple. Instead of 
each subscriber having to buy his own bundle of data, I will sell a bundle of data to the whole family. And I don't care which of the families of uh, family members are using this data. Now from a business point of view, excellent idea. First, from the family point of view, you can buy a bundle and you know if you have some extra in one user and some not enough capacity for another user, then it will arrange itself. So that's great. From the point of view of the operator, now to the customers it will be much more difficult to churn because it's no longer a decision of each subscriber, but now the whole family needs to, uh, to churn. So it's a good way to get and preserve the customer. Now from the point of view of revenue insurance, you need to do different things. Now you need to check at the level of the family, not at the level of the single subscriber. This also puts a lot of effort to the billing systems. You need to verify that everything is working correct there. So a new business model, you need to put different new controls for it. So before we go into your questions, I just wanted to point out Revenue assurance is changing. Revenue leakages are still there. They will not disappear. You can detect them, you can prevent them, you can lower their impact of the operator. It's very important to do it because the sums of money are huge. But in order to do it, you need to be aware of everything all the time where your business is going. What are the changes in your business? It doesn't make sense today to have a good protection for the main revenue stream of five years ago. Today, the main revenue stream that is producing you most of the money is another one. There are very good best practices, industry best practices for revenue insurance. It's very important to keep all the time track of these best practices. These best practices are evolving, are changing. We get more information will get more knowledge. By doing all this, you can be the most effective for your organization. So now give me five seconds and I will return to you with questions. Okay, I have one question about what is the ABDR. So let me go back in the presentation. The ABDR is the name that the PM form is giving to the analytics big data repository. Think about this repository as a repository in which you will have all your CDRs after some very limited preprocessing that will make them easy to read for everybody. So for example, transform all the binary format into a more simple format, perhaps prune some of the information there that it's not needed for most use cases. You will have there all the information about uh, that you got from the packet inspection, etc. So you will have there huge amounts of almost raw data. And from this platform that normally it will have several technologies under it. You may have there Hadoop. You may have there a columnar database. You may have there even a traditional data warehouse. But you will not have the information duplicated between these platforms. And now each new use case, each vendor that needs this information can connect to this repository can use this information to run its own application. Now, from a concept point of view, what are the big differences between this and the traditional data warehouse? Normally, in a data warehouse, in most places, you will clean up the information a lot before you put it there. So for revenue issues, in many scenarios, it will be problematic because, for example, Damage CDRs, problems, etc., will not enter into the data warehouse. 
in this ABDR, you will have almost raw data. Everything will go there. Each application will have to decide what they want to filter out. So it's a different concept, but the idea is not to replicate the data, but to put it in a single repository that everybody can use. Now, it doesn't mean that different applications will not copy for a certain time part of their data to their internal storage. For example, normally you will not use Hadoop to run a dashboard. You will copy some aggregation. You will copy part of your data to a columnar database, and you will run the aggregations from there for a dashboard. Let me see if we have any other questions. OK. We have another question about how you measure revenue assurance, the percentage of reactive, active, and proactive. Uh, well, basically, the way I recommend to do it is for each activity that you are doing to put a tag. This activity is reactive, active, or proactive. There are some lower cases, but for example, to put a control on an existing revenue stream, it's a reactive activity. and you know, if you correct the results of the controls before it goes to the billing, it transforms to active activity. If you send somebody to be part of the process change, then the time that this person uses is an active, is a proactive activity. So my recommendation, just put a tag for each of these kinds of activities that your team are doing, and then just count the amount of effort or money that you spend on them. Let me see if we have time for one more question. OK, how we can obtain the revenue best practices? Uh, OK, one way to do it is by being a member of the TM Forum, and then you can get all the documents for free from the TM Forum. And I know that some of you may not know if you are members of the TM Forum or not. In that case, just send to Shai an email, ask, and I will be happy to look it for you. Another option is that in CVIDIA, we work according to the best practices. So if you work with us, we will be happy to share with you these best practices. So I think that with that, we will have to finish. But of course, if you have any other questions, just send to Shai or to me an email or pick up phone, and I will be very happy to speak with you and with your team and discuss any point. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Have a great day, evening, night. Bye-bye.